Hello. My name is Maya and I'm an archaeologist with Big Ventures. For those of you who haven't met us before, we are a team of archaeologists who are on a mission to connect people who love archaeology with opportunities to actually do archaeology from online courses and events like this one, actual digs you can join for real. In fact, both of our speakers who are here with us tonight have been on digs, digs with us. Um, so let me introduce them. Here with me tonight to discuss the world of Stonehenge are two of the creative minds behind this extraordinary exhibit. We've got Neil Wilkin, lead curator and curator of Early Europe at the British Museum. He dug with us at Morecambe Bay, where we unearthed a Bronze Age burial mound. And also here with us tonight is Susan Greeny, senior properties historian at English Heritage, also affectionately known amongst us archaeologists as the Stonehenge spokesperson. She was part of the team that delivered the visitor centre and temporary exhibition, Making Connections. She also dug with us at Oldbury Camp, where we unearthed it all, or, or according to Sue, maybe it was actually a henge. And I just want to show you very quickly proof that they've both been on digs with us here tonight. So let's just share my screen one second. Here they are, both on their respective digs with us, having a blast. Let's get started. I've got a question. First of all, you might expect the first question I'll ask to go to Neil, but actually the first question I've got is going to go to our audience. What I would love to hear from you all is who has been to the exhibition and what was your favourite thing about it? I'd love to see some of your answers in the chat. So if you've been to the exhibition, please do share what you think was your favourite thing about it. And if you haven't been to the exhibition, can you tell us if you'd like to or why Stonehenge fascinates you so much? Really looking forward to seeing some of your answers here. And here they are coming flooding through. Lots and lots of people saying they haven't been yet, but they'd love to. Haven't been yet, but they've booked for next week. Been recently over the Easter holidays. Um, some people have already been. Um, they're loving the Neolithic wooden pathway. Stuart saying he loved the timeline of the history of the site. David saying he's hoping to go soon. Becky's wanting to go soon. That's going on Sunday. Um, Joe thinks learning more about the society around Stonehenge and the general culture of the time was fascinating. Gosh, there are so many, so many wonderful answers coming through. Debbie thinks the rich range of artifacts, love the hand axes. Alice is saying she was invited to go on opening night. Wow, lucky you, Alice. You loved the atmosphere and the gold, which is often the focus, was not the main event. That is definitely something we will talk about. That is definitely something we'll pick up and why that was the case. Um, brilliant. Loads and loads of really wonderful questions. I can't keep up with them all. Um, so let's get started with our questions for our speakers tonight. My first question goes to Sue. So you were involved, actually, in the breakthrough discovery of where Stonehenge, or some of the stones from Stonehenge, actually came from. And you worked on the exhibit at the Stonehenge Visitor Centre. What I'd like to ask you is that so our understanding of Stonehenge has come a long way in the last few years. What do you think is the enduring appeal of Stonehenge? And what do you think are some of the most important ways our understanding of it has changed? In part, thanks for your work. Oh, wow. Thank you. Well, I had a very small part to play in that recent research about where the sarsen stones come from. So the big stones at Stonehenge. Um, I think the enduring appeal of Stonehenge is it's um, it's such a familiar and simple shape that we can all imagine what it looks like. Um, if you ask anybody in the world about Stonehenge or most people can draw it. Most people give you an approximation of what it looks like. Um, and it's it's a unique site. So those lintels and the joints that connect the stones together um, are unique. And so I think it's just got that familiarity that means it's a bit of a touchstone. And it means that it's a way that people can imagine when somebody says prehistory or somebody says the Neolithic, perhaps if they're a bit more knowledgeable, or even if somebody says to them Britain, that's kind of what they think of. Um, and that's a real opportunity for us as archaeologists because 
Stonehenge is amazing and we have spent a long time and we'll discuss it a lot this evening, but the rest of the same period, the Neolithic and the period of prehistory in general in both Britain and Europe is just fascinating. There's so many interesting things. And as you say, research is always moving forward. So we're always learning new things about the questions that we've got about things like where did the stones come from and who were these people and where did they come from? Um, so, um, yes, yeah, so the Sarsen research that I was involved in a few years ago was um, relating to a, an amazing project by Professor David Nash from the University of Brighton, who is a geologist, and he has been developing techniques for identifying where the Sarsen comes from. And he um, has developed a technique where they, they look at the very tiny trace elements within Sarsen stone, which is otherwise a very uniform type of stone, and then take samples from natural outcrops in across different parts of southern Britain and they tried to match it to the nearest closest match and we were able to identify um, an area called West Woods um, which are some beautiful um, old woods full of bluebells at this time of year near the town of Marlborough in North Wiltshire about 15 miles to the north of Stonehenge and that seems to be the closest match for where the sarsen stones were brought from and that matches with the fact that um, there are some very large sarsens still remaining there, and also the area was used in very recent times as an industrial source of sarsen stone. So that's really exciting. So for the first time, we actually have definitely the area we think that those sarsen stones come from, and we can now start to explore more ideas about the routes over which the stones were brought, and also the extraction and the actual specifics of that particular area. So I'm sure we'll see new research coming out in the next few years about that too. So that's a, quite a fundamental change in our understanding that we can build off, as you say. Um, but there's so much more that we're starting to learn as well, and lots and lots still to come. What I'd like to ask Neil is, given all this change in how much we're learning about Stonehenge at the moment, how much there's still to learn, well, why now for an exhibition on Stonehenge at the British Museum? Mm. Well, it's a really good question and, and first of all, hi everyone, it's, it's a pleasure to, to be here, lovely to see you all. Um, why now? There's, there's several aspects to that and the first one is, is one that, that both you and, and Sue have already mentioned and that is that there's so much new exciting research, not just on Stonehenge itself but on the wider landscape of course which we'll talk about I'm sure this evening which is so interesting what's happening at those other monuments that are maybe not as well known uh, to visitors today, but that were incredibly important 4,500 or 5,000 years ago. So there's that new research that's really led to the British Museum saying, now's a great time to, to talk about this story and to, to, to work with colleagues who have done such great work over the last few decades. The second aspect is, is, is the fact that there just hasn't been an exhibition on this period and on Stonehenge for um, about 30, 35 years, which um, when I tell people, they're all astonished because they think, well, you know, in terms of archaeology in Britain, Stonehenge is one of the one of the great sites. But in fact, it was the last time there was an exhibition like the one we've got on at the moment was in, in the mid 80s in, in, um, in Edinburgh. So there's never actually been one in London. So that was the other that was the other dimension. And then the third factor um, one that possibly we can all relate to where, wherever we are in, in the world is that the COVID pandemic, um, I think, made a lot of us stop. Um, it made us think perhaps about our place in the environment, in the world. Um, and I think maybe in, in Britain particularly, I, I'm sure it happened elsewhere, uh, including in America, a, lo a lot of people um, were able to go out for walks and really re-engage with the landscape around them, or perhaps go on staycations to places that, that involve visits to ancient monuments, not just Stonehenge, but, but many other sites that are found across Cornwall and, and amazing parts of the British landscape. So I think there's those three aspects that really meant that now was, was a great time, both by chance and by planning, to, to stage this exhibition. And that, that's certainly what, what we've um, heard from the feedback we've got from visitors thus far. So it's a really, really good time for it. And I have to say, it, is, it was very noticeable when, when this exhibition came up, how, just how different the topic it is to what you might usually see at the British Museum. And um, you mentioned a couple of things, a couple of words there that I picked up on. So there was stories and there was landscape. And I think that's one of the really interesting things that comes across in this exhibition, um, if you visited it. 
people expect the exhibition perhaps to be just about Stonehenge, but it's not. It's about so much more than that. Can you tell us a little bit about what the stories are that you wanted to tell? What did you really want to get across with this exhibition? You're absolutely right. And um, we were a bit worried when we first started planning the exhibition that if we included Stonehenge in the title, um, even if we said the world of, that everyone would expect that all they were going to see were um, objects just from the, the monument and just from the wider landscape. That's not possible for reasons that um, Susan can, can, I'm sure, back me up on. And that is that there aren't an infinite number of objects from the actual site. It was kept relatively clean in prehistory, which is good for um, understanding the site, but bad for museum curators. So what we wanted to do is, is, is draw in those other sites that you find across Britain, Europe, um, as well, continental Europe, and put the monument in a kind of context and in a, in a wider picture. And I think someone in the chat has said that they enjoyed learning about the wider social and cultural uh, life of the time, so sort of filling out the picture. And I think we felt that was our duty and our role was to try and help to fill in the gaps because Stonehenge is very popular, lots of TV programs, lots of books, but perhaps the wider world and the people in particular, the people and the communities that occupied this world um, are not as well known. They're, they're still a little bit shadowy. So that's, that's what we were trying to do is fill in those gaps. But you've asked me an important question, which is what were the big stories? What were the big moves we were trying to get across? And really using Stonehenge um, or allowing Stonehenge to be the touchstone or this sort of thread that weaves its way through the exhibition, we wanted to look at three big transformations that happen in British and European society. Changes and transformations that, that I think are some of the most important that, that ever really happened. The first is the arrival and the spread of farming. And to us, farming might be something that we take for granted, but, but as you know, um, it was a revolution, a, rev a revolution in terms of how people lived, how they interacted with the landscape, their relationship with nature and the environment, attitudes to property and territory. And the very concept of building monuments comes out of this new farming way of life. So we wanted to explore that transformation to farming and the stories of people we, we know now from ancient DNA, which I'm, I'm sure is something that, that is um, talked about in, in, in the other um, presentations that you've, you've had, it's increasingly important in, in archeology span sort of ancient DNA is allowing us to see the movement of, of people and to, to put, um, you know, put sort of people into the picture again and see migrations of, of communities across Europe. And so we know that farming was introduced from Britain, not as an idea, but also as people moving across, across the channel. So that's a really important dimension. The second part of the narrative, and this relates particularly to the phase that Susan, that Susan was, was talking about um, when the Saracens are built around 2500 BC, is the arrival of metal in Britain and Ireland. And just the changes that that brings, the changes are not sort of dry and economic changes. It's not a sort of economic revolution alone. It's also a social and a, a change in religion as well that happens again through the movement of a new group of people and um, some 1,500 years after the introduction of, of farming, uh, the, the introduction of, of metalwork by a new people called the Beaker people, who, who, who I'm sure we can, we can come back to, but they're a fascinating group of people coming into the country and bringing these new ideas, including metalwork. So we wanted to explore that and how it related to changes in the landscape um, in, in the Stonehenge region and beyond. So what, what was happening between the relationships between the people who were already building and occupying the landscape around Stonehenge and this arrival of a new group of people, what were the dynamics? And that's a very exciting and interesting period of, of time. Something that Susan's done a lot of work on. And then thirdly, the, um, the, the shift away from Stonehenge, something that's normally cut off from, from narratives of this time is why did Stonehenge start to lose its power? Why is it not still the capital of England <laughs> if, it was, if it was such an important place? So we explore why around 1500 BC, 1500 BC, why um, power starts to shift away to other parts of England. And that's linked closely with the increase in trade and exchange and um, in increased circulation of bronze across the channel and across to uh, the east and south of England. So those are the three big moves that through the sort of um, 
through the kind of more familiar um, structure and story of Stonehenge, we try to we try to expand out on. And in, in amongst all of that, we try to bring as many people to the fore as possible. Something we realized early on is that as visitors to exhibitions, we relate to people. And that's why we like objects, I think, is because they're human and they, they help us to connect to, to people like us who lived in a very different uh, world to us, but who nonetheless had the same hopes, desires, fears, and so on as, as, as we do. So I, ho I hope that gives a sort of sense of the, that some of the bigger stories we're trying to get across in the show. Yeah, it certainly does. And I think just for the, those of you who haven't been, we will, we will come back to how some of these stories are portrayed and how, how they come across. But just to summarise, they come across really powerfully, but very subtly through the choice of artifacts, through how it's lit, through it's how it's presented. And we'll come to that because I think it's something really, really special about this exhibition that's very, very powerful. Um, I want to come back to Sue very quickly um, because obviously this exhibition has grown out um, not just of Neil's enthusiasm and what's happening at the British Museum, but out of work that you've been doing as well at the Stonehenge Visitor Centre. So can you tell us a little bit about how this exhibition has grown out of what was at the Stonehenge Visitor Centre originally and how it differs? Yeah, so Neil was just mentioning there that there hasn't been a major exhibition on, on Stonehenge for, for 30, 35 years. Um, but we have had much smaller exhibitions. And of course, the visitor centre at Stonehenge that we opened in December 2013 is houses one of those. Now we have a room a much, much smaller than the British Museum have for their special exhibitions available to us. Um, but we were able to um, have archaeological objects from the um, Stonehenge landscape and from Stonehenge itself on display there for the first time when that visitor centre opened nearly 10 years ago now. Um, and my role in that exhibition was to um, be curator, basically. We don't have curator as, as the, in the same way as job titles as, as the British Museum do, but it is, in effect, it's the same role. Um, and we had to restrict ourselves with that because it's a small room. We have um, international audience coming to Stonehenge who probably want to spend, say, 15 minutes in an exhibition, much longer dwell time, as we call it in the in the museum trade, um, than, than for an exhibition, say, like the one at the British Museum. So we really um, narrowed down what we were presenting, which was to just the Stonehenge landscape, its immediate surroundings, and just to the period that the World Heritage Site is actually inscribed for. So that is a period from um, the Neolithic to the Early Bronze Age. It's those monuments from that period that makes um, the Stonehenge landscape so special. So we really focused in on that period, and that means that, um, you know, there are lots and lots of other stories and context which, you know, is brilliant to be able to see in the world of Stonehenge exhibition, because in that exhibition, obviously, it runs right the way through from the Mesolithic, the time before farming, all the way through to the later Bronze Age, and having that much wider European context as well. So in some ways, the two kind of one, one sits almost with, with, within the other. Um, and at the Visitor Centre, we also knew that um, there are so many different stories to tell about Stonehenge that we were not able to fit them all into our permanent gallery. And so we have a very small room, which we um, use for temporary exhibitions, and that changes every um, few few months uh, or few years. Um, it hasn't changed for a while because of COVID. Um, apologies for that, but there will be a new exhibition um, in September, which we can mention in, in, at the end, perhaps. Um, and that space has been used for a variety of different exhibitions, focusing on uh, World War One soldiers at Stonehenge. We focused on the antiquarians. We focused on new archaeological research. For example, we had an exhibition all about food and feasting based on some new research that was coming out of the excavation material um, from nearby Durrington Walls. Um, but back in 2018, Neil and I collaborated on an exhibition there called Making Connections, which was um, uh, able to borrow um, some spectacular objects from the British Museum's own collections um, to tell the story of those wider European connections that Stonehenge has and try and set it in a bit of a context. And we worked together on the exhibition. We, we I mean, Neil um, was we had a bit of a wish list. We worked together on choosing the objects. Um, we, we wrote the text. Um, and that was um, a really brilliant experience because we were able to, in effect, I think maybe trial run some of the ideas that Neil then went on to implement in this much larger and, and, and broader show. So um, 
for me going around the British Museum exhibition um it was like meeting a few old friends because I was able to spot oh there's our JDAX that's the one we had and there's the the, the particular linear leather gold amazing colors that, that we had for example so they're, they're sort of dotted throughout this exhibition so um it was a bit of a dry run I guess for um um this much much larger and more impressive show so I hope that um also the way that um we have presented Stonehenge um, in our visitor centre and in our interpretation in the landscape and the audio tour and various other formats has also slightly influenced um, the work of Neil and his team because we deliberately decided in that exhibition to um, help people understand the chronology particularly by referring to the time before Stonehenge, the time of Stonehenge and the time after Stonehenge was built which really helps people understand the context of when different monuments were built in which period and how the landscape changed through that really important sort of central part of prehistory that we were talking about. And that is the same methods that has been used within the um, British Museum exhibition to also describe the chronology and kind of take you through um, the, the various phases and changes at Stonehenge. Um, so yeah, the, the, there's close connections between between the, the, the way we've been working. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think. think the, sorry, go ahead, Neil. I was just going to come in and say that's absolutely, absolutely true. We were we're very indebted to the the work that was done at the visitor center and how how particularly how to talk about time, which is always very tricky. I think because if we talk about two thousand years ago, it just seems such a a vast amount of time it becomes almost meaningless. So to have the monument as a reference point, as a hook, I think helps people to feel comfortable with those with those changes that are happening in the landscape. That, that was all I really was wanting to add. Yeah, and I mean, just going to basically echo those points, I think for me as a visitor, my experience of it really was, the, the things that really struck me about it were not only was it Stonehenge in the landscape, but it was those huge connections with a much wider, much wider landscape, not just the local landscape, but across Europe. And those kind of connections across huge expanses kind of exploded um, Stonehenge out of the usual way that we see it. And then the other thing was just how much it felt like you could absorb without having to read very much. I think there are a lot of exhibitions where you you spend all of your time looking at the tiny little bits of text next to things. And somehow the way that you create it, curated it enabled people to kind of walk around and absorb things on a much bigger scale. I think from the artifacts that you chose, the way that you lit them, as you say, the way that you explained the chronology was in quite a very simple but um, almost visual kind of way before, during and after. And it meant that people could really walk around and enjoy it and feel immersed in, in the world itself and kind of get a, a much more sensory experience of, of everything that was happening. And I, feel, I thought that was really, really wonderful and quite, quite a different approach to what you usually see in, in such big exhibitions anyway. Um, but on that point then, I wanted to... Um, I wanted to, I suppose, give our audience a, a hint of what's inside the exhibition. We're going to come back and sort of de de deconstruct it a little bit more afterwards. But for so many of the people here who haven't been able to go and visit, haven't seen some of the things that we're talking about, it would be really nice to see a little hint of what's in there. So we've already said there's over 450 artifacts. We don't have time to show all of them, but we are each going to highlight three of our favourites. And just talk a little bit about what it adds to the exhibition and why it's in there. Um, so let's start with Sue. I'm going to share my screen because I've managed to find a picture of what we're about to talk about. So here we go. Sue, this was your first choice of artifact. Yeah, so um, these amazing objects are known as drums. They're not actually playable musical instruments. They are solid chalk um, cylinders. And um, the three that you can see in the foreground of your photograph um, were found um, in a, a place known as Falkton. And so they're often known as the Falkton drums. And you can see that they've um, got this rather astonishing geometric um, sort of incised and carved, um, almost three completely three-dimensional decoration on them. They're all slightly different and the three are all slightly different sizes. Um, and they were found with the burial of a child. Um, and, um, these have been known about for a while. We had these um, in the uh, Making Connections exhibition that I just mentioned about that we had hosted at Stonehenge. Um, they're really enigmatic objects and they're unique. We don't, I mean, we have one other drum from a, a site in Sussex, which is uh, undecorated. Um, 
but they give a hint of the types of objects that we might well be missing from um, this period of prehistory because the decoration on them is very, very similar to some of the decoration we see on pottery from this period known as um, uh, grooved ware pottery, um, an early, early phase of the grooved ware pottery. Um, and it's quite likely that this decoration was used in textiles and in wooden objects and other things that we just obviously don't have surviving. Now, what's astonishing about um, this display is that there's a new chalk jump, which is the one that you, is at the back of your image, but um, uh, pe people can probably Google afterwards and find some better images of it because it's it's been the subject of a few different press releases and things um, over the last year or so. But at the site very, very close to where the original three were found, um, this one was found um, during um, some commercial excavations um, back in, I think it was 2015. Neil can nod his head if not, um, around about then. And um, it's exactly the same, the same sort of um, object, a very slightly different decoration. It's got some more spirals on it and things than some of the other ones. And it was found um, with the burial of three children. Um, and a few other objects. I think there was a chalk ball um, and some animal bones um, as well. So now we've got another of these chalk drums, which is absolutely fascinating because it, the first three were found with one uh, burial and the, the, the new one has been found with three children. So there's a nice kind of symmetry there. Um, and what's really exciting about this new burial is we were um, able to get a radiocarbon date, hopefully the first of several, um, on one of the burials. And that shows that these drums were being made and deposited in these burials around about 3000 BC. So that's about 500 years or so before the sarsen stones get put up at Stonehenge. Um, but it's a really interesting period of kind of the middle Neolithic when there's all kinds of different things happening in different parts of Britain and Ireland, which are kind of um, connected, but also very different to each other. So these are all, all from, from Yorkshire, I should have said. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's, I mean, for me, I'd never seen the Burton Agnes one, the new one before. So it's so exciting to be able to see it and to see it right next to its comparators. Um, you know, for this, this is an object for a prehistorian is just so exciting. And the, the decoration on them, you know, immediately, if you know your kind of Neolithic art, it brings to mind um, uh, Passage to Mart in Ireland, and it brings to mind um, grooveware pottery decoration. And, and you just have to wonder what on earth were these things. I should mention that um, a couple of them, I think the one that you've got in the foreground there, you can probably just about see on the left hand side, it's got this um, very distinctive eyebrow motif. And um, and the eyebrow motif is this very simple kind of little kind of joined eyebrows with dots for eyes, which we also um, find on some of the um, amazing megalithic tombs up in Orkney. This tiny little motif sort of links these objects with um, people and practices much, much further afield up in Orkney. Um, and it's fantastic to see that because figurative art, um, and there are a couple of examples in the exhibition, but actually depicting people and faces and, and, and um, character, you know, actual, actual almost, and, and also applies to sort of animals and things. The art from this period is pretty much abstract. We really don't have that many examples where we can actually say, oh, look, someone has made a face or they've depicted a human figure. Um, so again, that's really exciting to kind of understand more about the, these, art, these art styles and the decoration. Stunning, really, really stunning. And there's, yeah, lots of people commenting in the chat of like, how striking they are. Um, so onto your next favourite artefact from the exhibition. I hope I've got the right image here for you. Oh, yes. So um, Grimes Graves, um, if you haven't heard of the site, is... Um, a Neolithic flint mine in uh, East Anglia, just on the borders of Norfolk and Suffolk. And it's another site that English Heritage, who I work for, um, have the privilege of looking after and opening up to the public. Um, these were flint mines that were dug um, again just around about 2500 BC, that, that date when the sarsen stones are being put up. And what we've got on the site is over 400 really deep shafts where people are digging down 15, 16 meters to extract this incredibly pure and beautiful black flint that they're then using to make their tools. And these are two antler picks that were found at the end of one of the galleries in a pit that we now call Greenwell's pit after the uh, Canon Greenwell who excavated it. Um, and uh, these were found in the end of a, a gallery where it looked like um, the roof of the gallery had actually collapsed. And uh, the excavator described it as being as if the diggers had the, the, the miners had down their tools at the end of the day and had gone off for the evening and then the roof had collapsed and these these picks were laid out just where they'd been finished work being worked with 
and they were found um, with that tiny little skull in the middle, which is a bird skull. It's a skull of a bird called a phalarope, which is a wading bird, a coastal bird, which um, Grimes Graves is not anywhere near the coast, so it must have been um, kept and brought to the site. And also nearby was that beautiful um, greenstone axe. Um, and so this gives us a hint that um, that not everything down these mines was a practical consideration, that people were taking what looked like to be offerings or special objects that were then left in the mines. We kind of have a fairly good understanding that people in this period had quite complex beliefs related to the underworld and related to extracting all kinds of objects and, and artifacts and, and materials from under the ground. Um, and so it gives us a hint of some of those sort of more spiritual beliefs about the fact that they were taking material from deep below ground and that they had to give something back. Um, the other fascinating thing about these antler picks is because of the chalk, the wet sort of chalk that the, the miners were digging with, they actually have preserved on them the fingerprints of the miners who were using them, which is just such a real kind of immediate connection to the people that were using these antler picks four and a half thousand years ago. Um, so I think these are really special. I mean, that sends, that literally sends shivers at my spine when I, when I think about it, it's incredible. Um, so I couldn't find a picture of your third choice, um, but you did say the other thing that you really loved was the flagstones pot. So could you describe it for us and tell us why yeah. you think it's such a wonderful thing to include in it? I'm not surprised you didn't find a photograph of it because it's not very well known. Um, so the flagstones pot is a little dish about that big, and it's like a little flat um, pot. A little dish basically like you would maybe have like a little soap dish almost um, and it's made of quite dark um, clay and it's from a site called flagstones which is um, underneath the dorchester bypass in dorset in southern england and um, this is a site that is a, um, a sort of early henge monument and it's almost exactly the same as the earliest phase of Stonehenge. So the Henge earthwork around um, the monument of Stonehenge is the earliest part of the site and was probably dug out about 500 or so years before the sarsen stones were put up in the middle. And flagstones is a really similar circular monument and it's used for uh, cremation burials um, and inhumation burials very similarly to Stonehenge. And this little dish was found in the garden of the house next door and I pretty 100% sure it comes from flagstones because at Stonehenge, we also have one of these little dishes. And the decoration on this dish is very similar, a little bit to the chalk drums that we just looked at. Um, it's got this kind of crisscross corded sort of decoration, which we also see on grooveware pottery from this early um, period. And um, a very, very similar, though slightly more crude one and smaller one was found at Stonehenge, accompanying one of the cremations at Stonehenge. So it sort of links the two sites together. It suggests that there's very similar rituals and um, burial rites potentially happening between the two areas. And um, the decoration on it links it to that grooveware pottery. So we're talking about pottery that's being made in Orkney, that's getting found in the Stonehenge landscape, and this, and this dish is from Dorset. So it, it shows those connections over really long distances as well. We don't know what it was for. People describe it sometimes as a kind of chafing dish or a, a, something you would put maybe oils or embers into. But we honestly, we yeah, we don't really know what they're for. They look like potentially there could have been suspended. Um, but yeah, your guess is probably as good as mine as to what it was for. It's fascinating to make those little connections um, between the sites. It, it's really something that can draw the whole exhibition together, I think. So we are 447 artefacts left to look at. Um, Neil, which three are you going to choose to show us? Well, I have a um, secret to tell you, and that is that I, I only told my managers that we had 450 objects. We've actually got a lot more than that. <laughs> I just didn't want them to know how many we had, but there's there are a huge number to choose from, and it's it's incredibly difficult to pick the ones that you want to talk about. But I think the the one the first one that really <clears throat> kind of catches my breath and takes it away is it, it, at the beginning of the first part of the exhibition when you walk in and you turn to your left, you see this display of um, three um, absolutely beautiful jadeite axes, and I don't know if, if any of your if any of your viewers, any of the viewers have ever seen a, a jadeite axe, but this is a type of amazing um, rock that's only found in, in certain locations across Europe. Here we go. There's four of them, not three, I beg your pardon. Um, <clears throat> and um, 
in this case, recent analysis by a, a, a husband and wife team in France, the Petroquans, has been able to source the, the jadeite that was actually been used by communities right across Europe, or been sourced, I should say, by communities right across Europe to the to the northern um, northern Italian Alps. So amazingly, at a period about 6,000 years ago, when farming was first coming into Britain, it's not just animals that are crossing the channel, not just the sort of functional uh, everyday aspects of farming, but it's also the symbols of the farming way of life, the jade axes that have been passed down and moved across these really uh, elaborate um, trade networks across Europe into these uh, in new frontiers that, that farming's moving into. And the way I like to think of these axes is almost like um, objects of seduction. So you can imagine being a hunter gatherer or a fisher minding your own business and you come into contact with these new people with new ideas and you know one of them is carrying this object. I mean it looks like something from another planet. It's just so it's so beautiful in both its shape but also you you, know, you want to press your nose against the case because um, the, the, the quality of the stone, it's almost like looking through a telescope at the constellations of the stars. The, the colours seem to swirl and change as you look at them and the light sort of changes across the, 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 the axis surface. So this is both, um, I suppose, a, it's, it's a symbol of this new way, way of life, but it's also a reminder of something very, very important. And that's that with the arrival of farming, we get deforestation. Um, we've had deforestation before. Hunter-gatherers are known to clear land, uh, particularly in hunting practices. But the scale in which hunting, the scale in which uh, tre trees are felled, really increases by a, a notable fold. And that's seen in the environmental um, archaeological record um, that there's real an increase in deforestation. So this is also quite a poignant moment. This is the beginning of the transformation of the European and then British landscape. Um, becoming much more, you know, like it is today, I suppose. It's the beginning of that process to, to a landscape that's, that's really um, only now being reversed in some ways as people push to, to plant more trees and to foster those ancient, ancient woodlands and bring them back. So it felt like a very uh, topical, timely moment to talk about when this period of deforestation started and to talk about this, the axe as a, as a symbol of that, of that new way of life. And in the exhibition, we've actually got 98 or 100 axes on the wall vertically mounted to try and give people an impression that this really is a major shift in people's behaviour and people's interactions with the, with the environment. And in front of those 100 axes, one for each generation of the Neolithic, of this new farming way of life before the introduction of farming, in front of those 100 axes, we have a single elm leaf that fell at an archaeological site in the north of England, just at the kind of uh, first contact moment between hunter-gatherers and, and, um, and farmers at a site called Windy Harbour up near Carlisle. So this is a single leaf. And, and to my mind, and what a lot of visitors have said to me is that what it seems to represent is that sort of fragility of nature in the face of this, of, of this change of, of, of agriculture, this change of, of, of yeah, that's that's our leaf, um, a, a change to a new a new way of life. So that's the first that's the first object I was I was keen to talk about. And then the second um, is um, sea hedge, and um, I have a, a running joke with Susan that we wanted to borrow Stonehenge, but the paperwork was just too difficult to get it into the exhibition. But what we could borrow, and 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 you know we were scratching our 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 heads thinking. This is a big exhibition space. We want to wow people. We want people to feel a sense of what these monuments like Stonehenge were like. And amazingly, there is a monument that you can borrow, and it's it's Seahenge. And I, I don't know how many people remember the story of Seahenge, but um, it was found um, on the beach um, off the coast of, of Norfolk <clears throat> um, in the late 90s. Um, and it was recognized as an ancient monument, but the, the process of of understanding and studying it is, is really a fascinating one. And I really recommend Francis Pryor's book on Seahenge, which, which tells the story of how the excavators had to really battle to, to preserve and protect and excavate this, this, this timber circle. So what it was is essentially a, a timber oval, an oval rather than a perfect circle of oak posts. And they were, they were raised on a salt marsh between land and sea. And the reason we still have them is because the sea level rose 
and the peat grew and the timbers amazingly, uh, much like um, sort of Mary Rose, if anyone remembers that, that ship, the Tudor ship, were protected by the, the sea level rise um, for, for archaeologists to, to discover um, 4,000 years later. So we have um, some of the key elements of this timber circle within the, within the exhibition. And I hope it gives a sense of how important circles, not just of stone, but of timber were. And, um, you know, in the Stonehenge landscape, um, we know now that timber monuments like Woodhenge and the ones that were built at Durrington Walls were as important really as the stone monuments in the landscape. It's just that um, they don't preserve or they don't survive as well. So it's, it's been great to bring a timber monument to remind people that there were other really critical materials that had symbolic power to people in, in, in this period. And when people would have approached Seahenge, they would have um, seen the doorway, which is actually just in front of us, this sort of, uh, in the image, this sort of forked post would have, would have continued for another sort of meter and a half up. And that would be the doorway. And you would squeeze inside this timber circle and inside you would have been faced with a, a giant oak tree that had been turned upside down with its roots pointing up um, towards towards the heavens, so a kind of topsy-turvy world, almost as if people were turning the world upside down, perhaps to gain access to the other world or to the underworld. We, we don't know exactly what they were doing. It could also have been that they were using these roots of the tree as a kind of platform, what we might call in archaeology an excarnation platform to, to, to put um, human remains on top of. Those are all possibilities, but it's it's a wonderful, wonderful monument. It's wonderful that it survives and that we could bring it to the exhibition because I, it's been in, in King's Lynn Museum for, for, for a number of years and they've done a great job of promoting it. But, but by coming to London, we hope it's kind of, um, get it, it's put the, the spotlight back on Seahenge and hopefully made people realize what a wonderful, what a wonderful monument it is. So that's my second nomination. And my third uh, nomination is a bit of a no-brainer. It's the, the poster image for the exhibition, and that's the, the Nebra uh, sky disc. Um, this is, to my mind, one of, one of the most important, one of the most wonderful objects from uh, the period that we're looking at in the exhibition from, from anywhere in Europe. It, it was found in, um, in Germany in the late 90s, um, and we now we now think of it as the earliest depiction of the cosmos in the world and the reason we think that is because there's a cluster of seven stars that you can see between the the full moon and the crescent moon on the disc that cluster of seven stars um, is very likely the, the Pleiades um, cluster um, which is known amongst communities around the world as the, the calendar, the calendar stars. So their their appearance and disappearance in the night sky at different times of the year is, is, is often used by farming communities as a marker for key moments in the agricultural cycle. So the planting of, of your seeds and your crops and the harvesting of your crops. So they play an absolutely fundamental fundamental role. And then on the side of the disc, there are these gold bands. One is missing. You can see the outline of it on the left, just underneath the, the, the Never Sky Disc label. And then on the right, the gold band is, is still in, in place. And when you measure the, the angle that these bands create on the side of the disc, it's about 83 to 84 degrees, which is exactly the range at which the sun rises and sets on the horizon at this point in, in Germany at Nibra where the disc was buried. So the way I try to talk about this um, in the exhibition is that it's a kind of portable version of Stonehenge. It's encoding in information that you find in the alignment of monuments like Stonehenge and indeed at Seahenge as well related to solstice events, the shortest and longest days, but it's been made into a metal portable object that can be possessed. And this is something we explore in this point in the exhibition, is the shift from communal monuments like Stonehenge that are made of stone and, and have a very, have a, have a more egalitarian spirit to the arrival of metal and the way in which that can be possessed and controlled by individuals. And this is a time, to cut a long story short, that you see the rise of individuality more and you see more evidence of social hierarchies. So it's a, it's a really fascinating and important shift with the arrival of metal away from some of the 
uh, spirit and some of the social um, sort of dynamics of, of the preceding centuries. So those are my three uh, objects, but we could, I think we could both, Susan and I could both talk all night about some of our favourite objects and, and bore everyone to death, I think. Yeah, I think we all can too. And judging from everyone's uh, responses earlier when we asked people about their favourite thing about the exhibition, I mean, there's just so many wonderful, wonderful things to choose from. It's the, the one um, thing I should have said about the Nebra disc, I'm very sorry, is that the, the gold is from, it's very likely from Cornwall. So it's really nice to have that link. So we're all, the disc has almost uh, it's come back to Britain in some sense. It's, it's the first time it's been shown here and it's it's making that journey back along along the routes that the gold the gold took 3,600 years ago. That was a point I should have made. There are so many, so many wonderful connections to make. And on that note, I couldn't resist picking out a couple myself as well to share a couple of my favourites, some of which really speak to the points that you made. So the first one that I just wanted to show to people, which I'm sure lots of people will know about these figurines, but I, I just absolutely love these, these guys every time I see them. Um, and I think the reason why I wanted to just show people that they were part of the exhibition is, I mean, we've talked about farming and the landscape and metal, um, and you have touched on why it's really, really important to include wood, but I thought it was really lovely to see um, sailors and maritime travel and boats included in the exhibition as well. And it wasn't only um, with these figurines, but there were models of boats and depictions of boats, and it all just speaks to the fact that Stonehenge wasn't just this one isolated place. This was part of a world that was connected by land and by sea. And um, I think these guys are just fantastic. I mean, everyone loves them because they're, you know, they're charming, they're kind of slightly creepy, and they've got detachable parts that, you know, suggest maybe their identities are either somewhat fluid or maybe they can transcend um, our fixed ideas about gender today. So I think they're, they're really interesting in their own right, but because they show us that kind of maritime side to things as well, I think they're wonderful, really wonderful to include. Um, and one of the others that I wanted just to bring up quickly as well is um, these that come from uh, the Italian Alps. And again, I thought this was worth just pointing out to people that they can see this because Again, I think when we think about Stonehenge, we don't necessarily get a huge amount of time to think about the art and the artistry that goes with it. And I think one of the things that this exhibition did so well was to show that off, whether it is in how beautiful the Jedi axes are and what kind of skill and craftsmanship those took to create, but then also the kind of common motifs, again, that we've mentioned that keep cropping up on different types of artifacts from different sites. And then you have something like this, which is all the way over in Italy, where you can see depictions of the sun, of people, and all sorts of quite joyous things happening on it. And um, yeah, it's just, I think, a really, a real pleasure, a real pleasure to see. Um, so yeah, as we say, we could probably go on all night about the wonderful, wonderful things that are in this exhibition. But I want to leave a little bit of a sense of mystery so that people um, who books to go and see the exhibition can go and enjoy it and maybe those who haven't yet booked and are able to go and see it will do so to find out what else is there. I think now is the time to really start maybe trying to deconstruct a little bit of how the exhibition came together because there's some really interesting stories behind it and lots and lots of questions to ask but I think one to start with is um when you go for exhibitions these days, I think you, you generally notice that there is a choice between displaying things thematically and talking about different themes or in displaying them chronologically. And clearly with this Stonehenge exhibition, you kind of chose overarching, it was chronological. And I wanted to quickly ask, why did you make that choice and how did that kind of affect the stories that you were able to tell? Oh, well, that's a, a great question. Um, I think because we're dealing with um, such a long time ago, a time that typically when in, certainly in Britain not taught about in school, I think we had a, a responsibility to be quite clear about the sequence, the broad sequence of, of events so that people could follow the narrative clearly. I think that's what I would have wanted if I was coming in as a visitor, not having, having studied um, archaeology in, in the, this particular period. But actually, what we ended up doing is, yes, we follow broad chronology, but at the very heart of the exhibition, we 
we have the Nebra Sky Disc, a loan from, from Halle Museum, I should have said. And that's at the very heart of the exhibition. And it actually comes before some of the material from the very earliest metalworking. So we, we've actually um, created a, 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 an anachronistic element. And the reason we did that is that we felt the sky disc and the other objects in that space, which I won't, won't spoil, but are, are very, very gold and shiny. And um, we felt that that was the real dramatic heart of the exhibition. And I think, um, I think that when you're putting an exhibition together, it's it, you've got to be true to the the facts and the science, but you equally are are trying to create something that moves people and that has a has a narrative arc to it. So much like um, an opera or a soap a soap opera, you know, you need to have a sort of beginning, middle, and end so that people don't feel that you've kind of peaked too early. Never a good thing, right? Um, you want people to feel that the kind of peak and the, the, the kind of heart of the exhibition is happening at the right time to sustain them, right to sustain their interest and their emotions right through to the end. So we thought very, very carefully about when certain key objects appear in the exhibition and when certain moods also appear in the exhibition. And that's something that, 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 that um, is created through lighting, through certain um, elements of the design so that people feel and moved in different ways at different points in the narrative. So it's really um, something that is well beyond my skill set and well beyond my job. And it's why the, the museums and, and places like English Heritage have to um, employ such a range of, of, of great people to try and bring those different skills to it. So there's people that are great at lighting, people are great at design. And really, as, as a curator, I have the, the joy of having an overview of, of all of that, but definitely couldn't have done it on my own and had to take the advice of of others about how to put the exhibition together in a way that, that, as I say, spoke to people and pulled them through. That was definitely something that I want to pick up on is, yeah, the use of lighting and the use of sound and the use of the kind of the creating an immersive feeling as you're going through it. And as you say, that wasn't all down to you. You must have had quite a big team uh, working with you. And I kind of imagine that, you know, if you were going to have credits like at the end of the movie, you'd have this huge long list of, of, sort of sound engineers and producers and, and people putting things together to, to stage the exhibition. So could you tell us a little bit more about um, about some of these aspects of, of the exhibition? I think they are really they are really unique. The sounds, the lighting, how that all works. Yeah, absolutely. I think a good a good example would be the work that um, was done around Sea Henge. So we felt that Sea Henge had to be given an atmosphere, and it's from quite a eerie landscape. Anyone that's walked the beach uh, where Sea Henge was found, it, it, it feels kind of very otherworldly, and we felt that. To do an exhibition in London, which is a busy city full of concrete, to bring people back 4,000 years, you really, really needed to sort of help help people to, to feel immersed. So we were very lucky to work with um, an artist and archaeologist who's wonderful called um, uh, Dr. Rose Ferraby, and also with a musician and artist called Rob St. John. And they um, are very familiar with archaeology, obviously, Rose being an archaeologist and Rob having a lot of interest in it. And they went out to where the land in the landscape where Sea Henge was found and they took their recording equipment and they put microphones, you know, down pipes into the sand and on rusty gates and, and near the shoreline. And they, they created this amazing soundscape that, that I, I, I think is incredibly powerful. And, it has a kind of eeriness to it and that is entirely from the landscape itself where the monument is from it's not something we've got from a you know an online store that does sound effects it's a genuine uh, sound of, of of that landscape but intermixed with it is a musical a musical note or a series of musical notes so it's actually it's actually a very creative piece of of of, of soundscape production and that that's an example of, of the sort of the way in which I couldn't have done that, you know, we had to, we had to, we had to be able to draw on these amazing people that that can create those immersive elements for the exhibition. Yeah, and another one that really stands out, and I know one that Susan was really keen to bring up, is the use of light and how that relates um, to the the Stonehenge story. So as you walk through the exhibition, you really get this feeling of sunrise and sunset. At this point, I think I just want to hand over to Susan to talk a little bit more about that magical effect that's being created. Yeah, so um, 
I think what struck me when I saw the exhibition first was was some of the lighting and um, uh, the team have created this rather amazing effect of the end wall being a kind of moving um, film, but it's more really about the light, I guess, about, of a sort of sunset, sunrise. And um, that means that at certain points you look up and you can see right the way down the exhibition and see, as you can see in your photograph, the sort of the, the sun reflecting off the floor, just like it would off, off the sea or something. And it's, um, it, it really brings through this theme of the whole exhibition, which is the sun, um, which is introduced right at the beginning of the exhibition, when, you, when that, that stella that you just showed with the sun on it at the top of, of the stone. Um, and obviously Stonehenge is a monument that's aligned with the movements of the sun. And it's one of the key reasons that helps us understand how this monument was used and, and why it was built and, and what people were doing with it at certain times of the year. So um, for me, that kind of, that, that, um, somehow bathes the whole exhibition in a kind of light and it's a changing light as well so you get these lovely kind of pinks and oranges coming through but then there are different aspects and, and although you said it, it is chronological but I think somehow it is also thematic because the chronology does lend itself to certain themes so in in the Mesolithic era for example um, you know there's a soundscape of um, nature and birdsong and uh, sort of chopping a tree and sort of all kinds of different sounds that make you feel like you're in a forest and the lighting there does exactly the same it's sort of dappled um, and so it's quite different to other parts of the exhibition where where for example um, the Nebra sky disc is where it's much more black and there's an amazing array of, of stars and you feel like you're thinking about the sky and astronomy in the nighttime much more so I mean, I think those were done incredibly well. And although we said at the beginning that, um, you know, some of the aspects of the exhibition took inspiration from some of the things we've done in the Stonehenge Visitor Centre, conversely, you know, when we're, we're looking at, at what's been done and thinking, right, when, what, what we're doing next at Stonehenge and, and some of the ideas was certainly kind of sparking interesting thoughts about what we can do at the Visitor Centre next. So, um, yeah, I think the lighting is, has been done really, really cleverly. And I think it's not something that every visitor will notice, but it gives that, as you said, that immersive sense and that kind of emotional kind of feeling as you walk through the exhibition space. Yeah. I am aware that we are sort of running out of time, but um, I hope people won't mind if we continue for another 10 or 15 minutes, because we do have some really great questions left still to ask and some questions from the audience. So I think it might be worth asking then what isn't in the exhibition and how did uh, things that happened in the world around us, how did that affect what went in and what didn't? So, um, Neil, would you like to start with what isn't in the yeah, it seems still painful, still, pain, still difficult to talk about. No, not, not really. We've been incredibly lucky that we were able to get almost everything that we set our hearts on. And that's thanks to the fact that so many museums around the country and around Europe have been incredibly supportive and we owe, we owe everything to them. But there were some things that just were too big or not possible to, to move out of their permanent homes. One is actually the central stump of Sea Henge, and it just proved we were beaten in a way that um, our sort of Bronze Age um, ancestors weren't. We couldn't we couldn't move the central stump out of Lynn Museum. So if you want to see that, you you must go to Kings Lynn, and and actually that's quite that's quite nice because what it means is people can come to London and see what what we've what we've put on and then they can go to King's Lynn and see the, the central stump of, of, of CN. So I think that was the one of the main things. It just it just proved impossible. But 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 we were really lucky and, and COVID was obviously raging at the time that we were planning this exhibition. And I think you'll all remember um, at Christmas time, uh, recent Christmas past, things didn't look particularly good. There was the, the new Omicron variant that made things very uncertain and several lenders we're saying we're not sure we can, because of the virus, we want to bring the objects, but we're not sure we can. So our, our Christmas was one of, of sort of biting our fingernails. And we're just really, we were just so grateful in January when it became clear that we could we could get those loans in. So in, so, in, in some ways, I still see the exhibition as a bit of a miracle that we actually were able to stage it and able to open it with all the objects in place. Yeah, it must have, yeah, really affected um, sort of what went into the exhibition. And I think, again, one of the things that really stood out, going back to what is in it, <laughs> is the use of organic organic materials in, in the area. Um, but Susan, there was something that you obviously felt was rather missing from the exhibition as well. Well, it's not a criticism, it's just that um, 
you know, one of the most amazing things about this period is the monuments. And although Seahenge is absolutely fantastic to have it there in the centre of, of the exhibition, there is something about seeing some of those landscapes, seeing the original location about where some of these monuments stood, being able to go and have a look at Langdale and wonder how on earth they got up there and quarried axes from them, visiting, you know, major henge monuments in Yorkshire, for example, or seeing some of the stone circles on Orkney. Um, those of us who have been lucky to see some of these places know that that relationship between landscape and monument and what is built and the materials that are used is just so overwhelming but also crucial to understanding this period and it's just one of those things you know it's an exhibition in a box in London and that's how it, and that, and of course it's an amazing array of objects and I was so thrilled to be able to visit it several times already and I hope to go back again soon um, but I would also say there's a there's another bit of the story and that's the monuments and and in some ways in some of the periods particularly I would say and maybe in the early Neolithic and the late Neolithic and a little bit in the early Bronze Age too, a lot of people's energy and time and effort was going into building massive monuments or, or even smaller, but still quite uh, time consuming smaller monuments. So um, the sense of that um, almost sorts of balances out when you've got um, some of these more amazing objects and, and how the two kind of fit together. Um, and so, yeah, I would encourage people to not only go and visit the exhibition, but come and see Stonehenge as well, and also go and visit some of those amazing other monuments. Of, obviously, not everything survives from that period, but there are some actually stunning landscapes to go and have a look at where, where these things took place. Yeah, I would totally agree. I totally agree with that. And that, that's almost, that dictated our approach to the design as well. We didn't want to go down the route of a kind of paper mache or a spinal tap Stonehenge and leave everyone underwhelmed because why would you when you can go to, to the Stonehenge and, um, site itself and see and see and see it in, in, in the flesh? So I think it's absolutely the case that it's just part of um, an experience. And I, I hope people coming to the exhibition are inspired to if they haven't already to to, re, to visit or to revisit uh, the sites in, 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 in Wiltshire and beyond as well as, as Susan mentioned. So, yeah. yeah, so I think on that note, I've got one more question for each of you before we start picking up on some of the Q and A's. But what would you like to create an exhibition on next? <laughs> and for Neil, how do you actually go about getting the British Museum to put on the exhibition that you want to put <laughs> on? And for Susan, um, what have you actually got coming up next at the Stonehenge visit? So, Neil, yeah, what would you like to put on an exhibition on next? And how would you go about convincing the British Museum to do it? So, some, something that I mentioned at the start is this importance of um, ancient DNA. And, and I think what it's, a, I think it's revolutionising what we can say about a lot of the burials from the time period of Stonehenge and, 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 and after. And, and that that is because suddenly we can see the relationships between uh, individuals in cemetery. So you can see that these are father and son or brother and sister. And I think that really radically changes how we view the time period. Suddenly we can start to talk about family histories and lineages in a way that we tend to associate with history rather than prehistory. And then also we can start to then think about how objects are reflecting, say, family relationships or different kin relationships. So I think that's a game changer. And I think if, if you were putting on this exhibition in five, 10 years time, that would have to be much more to the fore. And I'm really excited about that. I think we're, we're kind of already seeing um, our exhibition becoming a bit old fashioned. And that's that's really good news because what it means is that the subject and archeology span is, is, is moving forward. So that's the first thing. The second part of the question is how do you get the BM to fit on an exhibition is um, I think persistence is the first part and then I, I think also um, just trying to, to, to think of an imaginative approach to, to a time period that people might think they know but maybe don't really. I think that's, that's the that absolutely key thing to it is getting beneath the skin of, of periods and monuments that we tend to um, think we know but that actually have a lot more to tell us. So, so that's that's my answer to that. We were sort of imagining that you might have to pitch it in some, some sort of Dragon's Den style. Um, I, I did have to pitch it at a Christmas party to Neil McGregor after several glasses of red wine. So that was kind of like a, a you know, very intimidating experience. Yeah. But you obviously won him over. And um, Susan, <laughs> how about you? What would you like to, What well, what is your next exhibition on? Because I know you've got one opening, well, in a couple of 
couple of months. So can you tell us a little bit about that and what's coming up at the Visitor Centre at Stonehenge? Yeah, sure. So um, in late September, we'll be opening our little exhibition on um, Jomon Japan, prehistoric Japan. Um, and that will be on for a year until next August. And this is focusing on a slightly surprising subject, I guess, for the Stonehenge Visitor Centre, which is the stone circles and the prehistoric settlements um, that are are exactly the same date as Stonehenge, but on the other side of the world. Um, and um, Jomon Japan has an incredible culture um, where they have amazing pottery, clay figurines, all kinds of interesting sites and stone circles. Slightly different to our stone circles, but very similar in, in some respects in that they're used often for burials and um, in that some of them are aligned with the solstice alignments. So we're going to be bringing over some really astonishing objects from some of our Japanese friends and museums over there and making the link with Stonehenge, which is slightly odd, but there are lots of actual connections between Japan and Stonehenge. So for example, I won't tell you them all, but William Gowland, who was an archeologist who excavated at the site in 1901, had lived for the previous 16 years in Japan and had worked there as an amateur archaeologist and actually learnt quite a lot of his techniques um, and, and had been inspired by prehistoric Japan quite a lot in his interpretations of Stonehenge. Um, so that's really exciting. So if you happen to come and visit Stonehenge after the end of September, anytime between then and next August, you'll see that. Um, I'm also working on a really exciting project at Grimes Graves, which is the site that we mentioned earlier, the Flint Mines. And we're doing a little bit of an upgrade there in terms of our visitor offer, um, being able to refresh the exhibition there and hopefully build a new building over the top of, of one of the mine shafts there. What I would really love is for somebody to give me a many millions of pounds and us first to build a proper visitor centre there because it is an astonishing site and it deserves much, much more investment and love than it gets at the moment. But we're, we're starting with baby steps. Um, so again, with Grimes Graves, if you're planning to visit, come after next March and you might see a much more upgraded and better site. Sounds fantastic. And I think I'll already start making some travel plans, as I'm sure lots of people in the audience will. OK, so I think we've got a couple of minutes left for some audience Q&As. Um, we've had a couple that were submitted earlier by our subscribers. So I'm going to start with that. So Simon has asked, what is the single big, biggest outstanding question for you about Stonehenge that you'd like to answer if you could? Who'd like to go first? I'd like to go first. Um, <laughs> I'd like to know how society was organised. I want to know how it was actually done because how the actual dragging the stones and all that kind of stuff okay that's that's fairly interesting but um it's the how do you persuade and motivate all of those people to take part in such a building project and who came up with the idea and who was in charge i would love to know how people related to each other how society was organized how people decided to travel and take part in this major building project and i'm not although lots of lots of our questions are being answered and we're finding out new things all of the time there are some things that are really difficult to get at for that period and it's particularly annoying that they didn't bury their dead in ways that are very visible to us as archaeologists in that particular period so we don't really have some of the evidence that we might otherwise have from skeletal remains or from burials but um yeah that would be my big question if i had a time machine i could go back i'd, I'd be really interested to see how it was done and who was in charge and how everyone was working together and how about you neil I think I would like to know about the, the, the connections that people, you know, we talk about connections between say Orkney and, and Stonehenge. I'd like to know how that played out in people's lived experience. Was it the case that many people were actually making journeys, pilgrimages between these sites or was that quite rare? Is it more um, sort of information and stories that are passed through communities over a long distance and maybe through time or are actually people in making these remarkable long distance trips. I would like to know just a bit more about, about people's mobility at a personal level, I suppose, with more, more, more resolution on that. And well, James has asked quite an esoteric but very current question. Um, does the overall exhibition narrative or anything that you've learned about the people of Stonehenge and their attitude to the environment and the cosmos Give us any lessons that we could put into practice today. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, I mean, I certainly learned lessons doing the exhibition. And one was, you know, I think I came into it with a bit of an attitude that, that farmers were chainsaw wielding maniacs who start this terrible decline that we're still living with. But, but actually, 
that's not what our co my, my colleagues who are more educated think and what they're able to show is that farmers were actually very um, minded to manage quite carefully the woodland resource. So they're doing things like coppicing the wood, which is something that um, gives you building materials, but, but can only be done for the next generation. So it's something where you're kind of thinking about the future. So uh, I think I learned that, that, yeah, people at this time are, are, are more careful, more um, minded and more, more, um, generous in how they relate to, to the woodland environment than, than I had assumed, and certainly some of us um, have been in recent generations. Yeah, I think I'd agree. I think um, one of the things that's come strongly through my research is that, that prehistoric people had a real sense of place and that they noticed things in the landscape. They noticed geological features. They knew about materials. They knew the watercourses. They knew their landscape. And I think that connection to an understanding of how their actions affected the landscape and, and where they could find the resources and, and how they navigated around that landscape are things that we've just completely lost um, as kind of at least in, you know, 21st century Western Europe. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's lots we could learn um, from, from the lifestyle and the attention that people paid to the landscape and to their environment. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I, I I guess I'd like to think that, that that's one aspect we could learn from in terms of, of, of prehistory. The other is just that sense of communal projects. I mean, if, if you tried to build Stonehenge today, um, the, you know, there would be a lot of project management and health and safety and all kinds of other things. But, you know, just persuading that many people to get together and work communally on a project, I'm not sure we could do it now. Um, and that's, just, you know, that sense of working together for a common purpose and achieving things that are absolutely incredible and we still look at Stonehenge and, and think it's amazing today so yeah that that sense of being able to work as a community uh, you know that we'll have some of what they've got I think yeah it would uh, be really great to understand what was what was at the heart of it or what was motivating them to build build things like that um someone has also asked is there any chance that this could possibly be made into a traveling exhibition particularly to his hometown in the USA um, we, we've got no, unfortunately, we have no plans to, to tour the exhibition, and that's because it's so reliant on so many different lenders who really need and want the objects back in their museum collection. So while we looked at it, there's just no no possibility of that. But, but although the British Museum can't tour uh, alone, I think there are several um, other touring loans that people like Mike Parker Pearson have been, have been involved in. That either have toured in the states or are maybe continuing to do so, but I'm afraid I don't. Unless Susan knows, I don't. I don't really have the details of of, of the venues or the timescale for those for those touring loans. But yeah, I don't have the details, but I know that there's a current exhibition currently on in Germany. Um, I think it's at Hearn, um, and there is a touring exhibition. It's either been to America or it will come to. So do keep an eye out because you never know when things are coming to you more locally. Yeah. I think it's really fantastic to see how much this exhibition is inspiring people, even if they haven't been able to get there. Um, and I think what we can do for everyone is we'll send, an e we'll send an email around to everyone afterwards that has a recording for this event, but also some suggestions to do what you can do if you can't make it to the exhibition. So we'll include some reading ideas, some sites you can visit, and other possible exhibitions that you might be able to visit, including the one opening at the Visitor Centre in September. Um, so it is now almost 20 past seven and we have run well over our time, but thank you to all of you who have stuck with us throughout. It has been really wonderful um, to be here and I'm just sorry that we couldn't answer more of your questions in the time. I know I still had loads lined up that we didn't get through. Um, but before we go, I think it would be great if we can highlight just a couple of other things that are coming up um, at Dig Ventures. So it would be wonderful to see some of you all at some of our next events, including a virtual tour um, of Glen Garnet Castle, which we'll be excavating over the next few weeks, um, and how to draw a medieval castle as well. We also have literally a hundred events coming up um, in the Black Country at the moment as part of Made in Smellick, which focuses on industrial history and also an archaeological field tour at Salton Hall in July. So if you are interested in checking those out and having a go at archaeology yourself, making your own discoveries, um, head to our website to find out more.
Otherwise, I think it's really time just for a big, big thank you to Susan and Neil. Um, and just to re-emphasize, uh, yeah, make it to the exhibition if you can, or go and visit Susan's exhibition in the autumn too. Um, if there's anything else you'd like to share or say before we head off, Susan and Neil, then, then now is your chance. Um, well, thank you very much. It, it's been really, really enjoyable, as ever. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, everyone, for such nice comments and um, questions. I would also recommend the exhibition catalogue or book <laughs> that Neil has not mentioned, but I will do so on his behalf, which is excellent. And if you read that book, you will be as knowledgeable as me and Neil are about this <laughs> <More>. period. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Susan. Thank you all so much. And we'll follow up with those suggestions in our email afterwards. Thank you once again all for being here. Your comments have been much appreciated and it's wonderful to see so much enthusiasm and curiosity about the past. Long may it continue. We'll see you all again soon.